Um, the culture in which we live and work and worship is a culture that is post-truth. It's post-modern. And uh, we're going to take a look at 2 Peter 1 today. If you'll open there, you might even have your outline ready. If you got one of those when you came in. And this post-truth, post-modern culture um, <clears throat> is one that says there is no absolute truth. And the truth of uh, the uh, sacredness of life in the womb is uh, being called into question. Um, and, and we're even debating that, as if we had to debate that, that, that God uh, brings life at conception, <clears throat> and God has a plan for that individual and that life. It's a wonderful truth. And, and yet, in our postmodern, post-truth culture, we look at that, and we, uh, they call that into question. Um, the the um, truth of human sexuality is God designed it. It's being turned upside down. And, but God was clear in his word uh, that, that he designed it. Male and female created he them. That's what Jesus said. And so the, the Bible gives us the truth that grounds us in a culture that is post-modern, post-truth. Now, the truth of marriage is being attacked. Uh, the, the, the reality of marriage and God's purpose in it. And so um, it is, <clears throat> uh, it's necessary, uh, and it's never been more necessary, but it's necessary in every culture that we would immerse ourselves in the truth of the word of God because that truth is being attacked on every front. But here's the wonderful thing. We have that truth and we have it in God's word. Now, I don't ever, I, I, maybe years ago I did, but I don't ever get to the point where I go like, oh, wow, poor, we poor Christians here in 2020, you know, we're being attacked and our truth is being attacked and it's never happened. It's happened all the time throughout history. As a matter of fact, this book of 2 Peter was written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost by Peter. There are some that deny that, it's, that, that Peter wrote it. They don't necessarily, people that believe it's scripture don't, uh, some of them deny that Peter wrote, uh, wrote it. You can read the article or the uh, arguments, but I firmly believe that it was Peter uh, who wrote this. Um, it, it was from Peter, inspired by the word, uh, by the Holy Spirit. But um, at this time of this writing, it was a culture much like ours today. It was a superstitious culture. Uh, there were a lot of voices that were speaking into that culture. Uh, human sexuality was topsy-turvy. Uh, through the Roman Empire, there was abortion. Uh, we, we, th there's, Satan doesn't have a lot of new devices. He has nothing new. He, he recirculates the same uh, falsehood over and over and over again. So what, the, what God's response was, what his answer to that false, the, the, the uh, society of false truth was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you truth under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So what we're going to see today was written by Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost into a culture much like ours today. Now, what we're going to find is several things. We're going to find out, uh, number one, that, that Peter uh, was writing this book into a culture where there were a lot of false teaching and, 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 no, and, a lot, and very little truth, okay? So 1 Peter, years ago we studied 1 Peter. 1 Peter uh, was uh, written to Christians who were scattered and they were suffering persecution. And the persecution wasn't necessarily that they were being killed. The persecution was... More like persecution you might face, which is, oh, I see you have your Bible. You believe that? <laughs> that's that's just fairy tales. You know, they <clears throat> they were um, being persecuted in a way that people were, were were attacking and belittling and making fun of the fact that they might assemble together like we're doing today, or that they might uh, quote scripture or talk about Jesus and say he rose from again and he was from the death and he from death uh, and he was uh, virgin born and someone would look at that and go like you just don't know what you're talking about and that's crazy stuff and they were being attacked something like that they, they, they were being persecuted like that 
And so 1 Peter was written to those persecuted Christians about how to suffer. And then 2 Peter was written uh, to those same Christians uh, that were now Peter is going, I, I'm getting ready to leave and I want to warn you about some false doctrine. I want to, t- t- I want to warn you about false teachers that are coming to undo the truth and rob you of the truth that has been given to you and they're going to try to undermine that truth and so Peter second Peter was written uh, to say hey there's some false teachers by the way that would we would do well to understand that we've never had more information available at our fingertips can I tell you this a lot that seems good today a lot that feels good today on television and on the internet, uh, you must compare what you hear to the truth of the word of God. And, and, and uh, when, the, when it contradicts what the word of God says, you know what's false and what is true because what God wrote is true. Now, if you doubt any of that today, we're gonna take a look at that today, but uh, that, that's what we have to understand. So, so the way that Peter uh, takes care of false teaching was this. Let me give you truth. Let me give you truth. Let me give you truth. That's the way to um, expose false teaching and false doctrine. What? Truth, truth, truth. We spend a lot of time here at International trying to give that truth out. Uh, That happens uh, uh, Monday through Friday at International Christian School. That happens on Tuesday nights in our growth groups. That happens on Sunday at 9 and 11. Uh, It happens in uh, American Sign Language. It happens in Spanish. It happens in English. It happens with the children uh, at 11 o'clock and in the nursery. We exist to give truth because what Paul said is that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So Peter, you know, hey, there's false doctrine and false teachers. And what he did was to give the truth. So We don't have to be confused. That's the good news. We don't have to be confused today. We know there's a truth, and we find it in the pages of the Word of God. You say, yeah, but I don't, sometimes I just don't get it. Okay, we we understand that that for a few reasons, that truth isn't always easy to be understood. Part of the reason is because we live in a culture, and and people have always lived in a culture because it's a fallen world, and the the perfection of the garden had the falsehood and the lies that came from Satan. And it's no different today. So there's going to be lies and falsehoods and false doctrines. And, and so we have to do what? We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. And so don't ever feel bad. I just don't understand the, the Bible. Uh, and, and some people uh, say, although the best students of the Bible in this church, uh, you don't call them pastor. It's not me. We have wonderful students of the word of God that I learn from them. And I go, wow, you know, uh, we're just students learning together God's word. And so I, I, we, we take that very seriously. So, so here is Peter, uh, and he is exposing the false doctrine and the false teaching, and he's doing that by giving some truth. And um, uh, since the, the time of the writing and sending of, of Paul or Peter's first letter, Peter had become concerned about these false teachers. And so now in this book, uh, it's almost like Peter's last will and testament. Peter's getting ready to die. And, uh, and we understand that from his writings uh, in verses 13 through 15. We'll read that in just a little bit. And, and so we understand that he has said uh, in chapter 3, he said, I, I'm, I'm writing this to the same group that I wrote 1 Peter. 1 Peter is very clearly uh, written to scattered Christians that were in Asia Minor. Uh, there in, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 1 of, of uh, 1 Peter. So these, these provinces, they were lo- located in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. And so imagine that. It was a bastion of truth. Modern Turkey was a bastion of truth, but false teachers were already coming in. Uh, in uh, uh, you know 66 AD, remember Christ died you know, around 33 AD, some, somewhere around there. And so now in less than 30 years, false teachers are already coming in trying to undermine the doctrine and the truth. And so Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writes 2 Peter. And now he is, 
He's trying to expose these lies and he's trying to help those Christians to be able to defend themselves against false teachers, against deceptive lies. He's trying to instruct them in um, a, a, apologetics, which is simply being able to give an answer for our faith. By the way, that's something every one of us should be concerned about. Because people have a right to go, you believe that? Why do you believe that? Well, what about this? What about this? I've heard this. And, and would to God that we would study and continue to grow that we might be able to answer those questions that our culture has. Worst thing we could do is to be offended by those questions. The best thing we could do is to understand and believe and assume it comes from a heart of sincerity that says, hey, I've got all these choices to make. Why should I choose Christianity? And what we're going to talk about today is one of the things, one of the reasons why people reject Christianity, but that was already happening in, the, in 66, 67, 68 AD when Peter wrote this. It was already happening. People were already questioning. And so this is going to be so appropriate to you and me living in 2020. I'm really excited uh, to share this with you uh, and to get into this passage of scripture. So let's read the text for the Bible. Uh, we're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, and we'll read down through verse 21. Here's what the Bible says. But these, as natural brute beasts, uh, made to be taken, uh, I'm, I'm, let, let me see, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in, I'm in chapter 2. I want to be in chapter 1. Wherefore, I go like, I didn't study that this week, really, you know. I, I'm not prepared to talk to you about that yet. Uh, but first Peter chapter, or Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. He's talking about his body. A tabernacle is a tent. He said, this isn't the building. This is just a tent. And tents don't last very long. And so even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. We'll talk about that later. What did Christ show him? Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So he said, I, I'm, getting, I'm not long for this world. My time is coming short. And uh, it's the time of my death is coming. My life is short. Don't have much time left. And I want to stir you up. And how am I going to stir you up? I'm going to remind you of some truths. Boy, these truths are going to stir you up today, church. And so uh, we have not, verse 16, followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day of dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so let's take a look uh, at, at this. You know, Christians today, sometimes we are careless in our pursuit of truth and doctrine. But in verse 8, if you'll go back uh, to, or to verse 8, we didn't read it yet. It says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes we are careless about our pursuit of the truth. And, 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 and uh, Peter said, hey, listen, uh, the, this truth that God's revealed, uh, his revelation to us will make sure that you're not unfruitful and, and that you are not barren in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's reassuring them and telling about this. So let's look at these aspects. First of all, uh, number one in your outline there, a thoughtful goodbye from the apostle. He gives them a thoughtful goodbye. This is something that he is aware is going to happen soon. And beginning in verse 12, 
uh, he begins to talk about that. He said, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it meet. I, I think it's important. I think it's appropriate. As long as I am in this tabernacle, as long as I'm alive, I want to stir you up, putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So this thoughtful goodbye. Now, Nero died in 68 AD. We understand that. Uh, tradition, history tells us that Peter died in Nero's persecution. And so this letter may have been written just before his death. Maybe some think 66 AD or 67 or 68 AD. But it was around that time that Peter uh, apparently wrote this epistle. Now, Peter doesn't exactly uh, say where he was when he wrote this letter. In 1 Peter, he said, I'm in, I'm in Babylon. Uh, but now we're not sure where he is when he writes this, but many people believe that he was in prison in Rome. He's facing imminent death, and, and shortly after this letter was written, uh, we know that Peter uh, wa was martyred, uh, and uh, according to reliable tradition, historical accounts, Peter chose to be and asked to be uh, he was going to be crucified, so he asked that he be crucified upside down because the Savior was crucified right side up. And so tradition and history tells us that was how Peter chose to die. And so it's, it's on his mind. It's going to happen soon. Uh, and he says, my end is near. That's what he's saying in this word. My end is near. And so the apostle was probably more than 70 years of age. Uh, he would had uh, something that he desired to communicate. And uh, he, three times he tells us that he wants to be sure to remind us of it. Listen to this apostle. Listen to his urgency in verse 12. F follow along there. Wherefore, I will not be ignorant to put you always in remembrance of these things. He, why? Though ye know them and be established in this present truth. He said, I want to reiterate. I want to tell you again. I don't want to be careless. I don't want to be negligent. I, I want to I let you know about this truth Again, at least one last time, verse 13. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Uh, uh, the, the songs that we sing, that'll stir us because it's reminding us of these incredible truths. And so Peter said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna tell you about these truths. It's gonna stir you up. It's gonna stir up your heart and your mind. Verse 14, knowing that I must shortly put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Paul's going, I want you to remember. I don't want you to forget. I want you to remember now while I'm alive. I want you to remember after I'm gone. You need to remember these truths. And so here's this thoughtful goodbye. It's purposeful. He says, my end is near. So now I'm telling you these things. Now he says here, in verse 14, I'm going to put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Well, there was an amazing prophecy which the Lord gave to Peter, listen, almost 40 years before. Now, if you were 30 and uh, someone came to you and said, hey, you're going to live to be an old man or an old woman, you'd go like, well, that's a bold prediction. You know, I wouldn't know if that's true. But when Jesus said it to Peter, uh, Peter knew that would what was what would happen and Peter understood some things from the Lord about his death. Notice what it says. It's in your outline there in John 21, 18. Verily, verily, here's Jesus speaking to Peter. When thou, and, he, and he's calling him to be a disciple, very early in their relationship, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and shall carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Amazing. Peter, facing death, stirs up these scattered, persecuted believers, and he said, um, God, uh, you know, Christ told me that I would live to be old, and I'd stretch forth my hands, and he was speaking of his death. Someone's going to carry you where you don't want to go, and he's speaking of his crucifixion. In old age, he would be martyred, and so my end is near, but not just my end is near. You know what is sweet 
And I don't mean to be morbid today, but it's sweet to be near someone who is facing difficult circumstances with their health and maybe the uncertainty of death. They hope not, but maybe they are, or maybe they already know, and they have a spirit of confidence as they face death. In December, I went to, I got a phone call uh, from, uh, from, from a friend in California, one of my aunt's neighbor, uh, and she said, Ray, we, we have to pray. Aunt, you, your, your Aunt Pam is in the hospital, and she told me the story of Pam, um, how she went in for surgery, and she uh, had gallbladder surgery, and they began to operate, and they found so much cancer that they couldn't even perform the operation because she would bleed to death, and they sewed her back up, and, and they spoke with um, uh, they spoke with uh, Pam's neighbor, uh, who then called me and said, "We have to pray." And um, in the course of that, uh, as Pam uh, was diagnosed, and then ten days later, she passed away. Really surprised us. We didn't know that she had cancer. And and my question before I flew out there, I said, I, I, I asked her neighbor. I said, Valerie, did when, when they began to talk with with Pam about the fact that she had cancer and it's really, really serious. So did she ever waver in her faith? Was she frightened? Was she scared? And Valerie said, Ray, not one time. Not one time did she get frightened. It was just a matter of fact, okay, how are we gonna fight this and what can we do and what do you suggest? And her, her, her purpose was to get well and to get better, but Pam knew Christ as her personal savior. Not one time did she waver. There's something sweet about that. When a Christian faces something like Peter is facing, and Peter goes, the end is near, but I'm encouraged, and I'm stirred up by this truth, and I want to encourage you. Isn't that the time, Tony, when we need encouragement? Except in the life of a Christian, I've seen it over and over where Christians at a difficult time in their life are the ones encouraging someone else. My friend, that is God's grace. And so here's Peter. The end's near, but my heart is full. I'll tell you what, I don't want a God who can't make a difference at the end of my life. I don't want a God who, uh, when I face the most difficult enemy, the most formidable enemy that mankind ever has, that we go like, well, you know, God's strong, but this is death. And so we get swallowed up in death. No, no, not our God. He has victory over death, and that victory over death gives us grace at the right times in our life. And so my, the end is near, but my heart, <laughs> my heart is full. Roman historians uh, said this, in, in their very deaths, uh, you, you know, because Nero was persecuting Christians, okay? So Nero is persecuting Christians. That's one reason why Peter was there. And here's what a Roman historian said about Christians under the terror, terror reign of Nero. They said, in their very deaths, they were made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs. In other words, they'd put them in, the, 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 in wild skins, and then they would let dogs hunt them. Can you imagine this? They were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs, or nailed to crosses, or set fire to and when the day waned, burned to serve the evening lights. They'd take Christians and use them as torches. Unbelievable persecution. And here is Peter. And yeah, that's going to be my fate. One of these deaths, these horrible deaths, is going to be my fate. And yet he says, my heart's full. I'm stirred up. Friend, that's a real Christianity. That's a genuine Christianity. And if you today don't have that certainty and couldn't face the enemy of death without this quiet confidence, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be emotional. I'm not saying that you should embrace it with open arms. I'm not saying that you shouldn't stave that off. God put in us a desire to survive. I'm simply saying that while it would uh, shake us, it wouldn't bring us down. While it might shake us, it wouldn't destroy us. And so here's Peter. Peter. The end's near. How do you feel, Peter? My heart's full. Why? Because the truths that I spent my life preaching and that I heard from Jesus, they're still true. Wow. And so 
Peter knew death was, it was imminent, but he was going to be martyred and his heart was full and he wanted to leave us with something that would stir our hearts and minds. So this life application, Christians can face their last days with peace and confidence. What a God, what a savior. What, a, what, what a, um, an amazing truth the gospel brings to our lives. But secondly, we see this, a reliable testimony of the second coming of Jesus Christ. A reliable testimony of the second coming uh, of Jesus Christ. Notice what, uh, what he says here. He's, he's uh, in verses, in, beginning in verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now, so here's, um, here's Peter. If you want to know what someone really believes, look at the end of their life. It, you know, we, we can say a lot of things, but the end of our life when we start to face mortality, um, that's why I asked my, my Valerie, I said, how did Pam respond? Did she show fear? Was she scared? What, you know, no, Ray, she, her faith never waned, and she, was, she wasn't frightened. She, her future was secure. Listen, um, with, with Peter here, what we see, what we know to be true uh, is that uh, this? Uh, that what 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 uh, what he believed and what he preached? The thing that was important at that point in his mind was that he began to think about the second coming of Jesus. Why? Because the second coming of Jesus meant that when he died the first time, he did indeed rise from the dead. Peter's getting ready to die, and if Jesus didn't come out of the tomb, Peter has no hope of coming out of the tomb. And he asked, if Jesus didn't have eternal life and isn't living today, Peter has no hope of eternal life and living forever. And so his mind naturally goes to, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. He's coming again. And he talks about that here. And so uh, P Peter gives two lines of verification. Hey, Peter, it's the end of your life. Do you really believe what you taught? Do you believe, really believe what you preach? Do you really believe what you're dying for? And he gives two reasons, two lines of verification. The first was a supernatural experience that we just read about in verses 16 through 18. And the second was a supernatural revelation that we're going to read about in verses 19, 20, and 21. And so together, those two things affirm that the Bible is indeed True, and so Peter's basic point is simple. He says, hey, you can trust the Bible writers and you can trust the apostles uh, because what we've penned, we've, we, we've uh, personally experienced what we have written down we lived through. Um, you're not getting a secondhand information. Uh, you're not getting uh, uh, information that was that we heard from someone. You're getting firsthand information from firsthand eyewitnesses. And when we wrote to you, uh, he says, as he did in the first epistle, he said, when the other apostles wrote to you um, and, and they spoke about the second coming, they were eyewitnesses to the second coming glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. In other words, why, why Peter is saying this is he's saying, listen, I'm going to encourage you with truth, and I want you to know I didn't hear this from somebody who heard this from somebody who heard this from somebody who read it in a book. He goes, I lived through it. I lived with Christ. I saw the risen Savior. This is a firsthand testimony. Someone who says to you, I just don't believe the Word of God. You know the difference in the Word of God and other, quote, religious books is this. The word of God was written by eyewitness account. It was written by people who saw. When someone in the Bible said, hey, Jesus rose from the dead, they mean I touched him. I saw him. I talked with him. I had breakfast with him. That's the difference. In this, this book, it was written by eyewitness accounts. And so here was Peter. He said, this is not a common source. Where uh, would Peter get the message that he was going to leave uh, us with his, with his, the, with, with, you know, uh, where did he get this message that he was going to leave with us as his final words? Well, first of all, uh, he tells us where he didn't get it. And I love this. He said, he says, um, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. 
when we made known unto the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we didn't get that. This isn't a fable. This isn't a story. This isn't something somebody dreamed up. We didn't just make this up. We're just telling you what we saw, what we heard Jesus say, what happened in his life. And then, not only was it not a common source, but it was a reliable source. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, some people would say that they would believe in Jesus if they heard from God himself. Yeah, I, you know, if God came down here and told me, if God spoke to me, then maybe I'd believe what happened with Jesus and that he could save me. Can I tell you this? What Peter goes into right here is God himself speaking because that's the example he's gonna give. Now, during the time of Jesus, during the life of Jesus, there were three times that Jesus spoke audibly when people were around and people heard him. And they weren't always believers that heard him. There were often unbelievers that heard him. One of those times was when Jesus was baptized, beginning of his earth, earthly ministry. Remember, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Another time was at the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. There was another time before Jesus um, uh, was, uh, was crucified, uh, nearing the time of Jesus' crucifixion. God spoke from heaven. John 12 tells us that. It says, uh, now Jesus is saying, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then listen. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said, it thundered. Others said, an angel spoke to him. And Jesus said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. In other words, Jesus said, he could have assured me quietly and more only I could have heard it but it came loud and clear so you would hear and know who I am. Time after time, God did speak in his own words, audibly, this is my son. And so this, uh, re- this, this is a reliable source. Peter brings this illustration up. And, and, uh, uh, and, and so in verse uh, 16, Peter says, um, he, he, he says we, notice Notice there in verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables, but were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Now, who are the we there uh, that, uh, that, that uh, saw Jesus coming in power and glory? Well, well th- here's the story. It's, it's in your uh, outline there in Matthew 16. Jesus was talking to some of the disciples. And uh, as he was talking to some of the disciples about his second coming in verse 28 of chapter 16 of Matthew, he says, verily I say unto you, There shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Now, just a careless reading of that says, hey, they all died and Jesus hasn't come back yet, so Jesus must have been lying. That's not at all what he was talking about. He said, you're going to see the glory, that same glory that's going to result in me coming back. Some of you standing here are going to see that glory before you die. That was... That came to pass six days later in Matthew 17, verse 1 in your notes. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into the high a mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. And, and, um, and, and so um, I, I won't finish reading that text. You can read that later, but this is what Peter is talking about. We were eyewitnesses. The glory that would raise Jesus from the dead, we saw it. He said it would be, happen, and six days later it happened, and we saw Jesus in his glory. And one day, we will see Jesus return in his glory. That's going to be a wonderful day. Yeah, that's going to be great. We're not hopeless. And so Peter goes, I'm about to die. 
Peter, you must be discouraged and depressed. Nope, let me tell you about the hope that I have. And, he, and he's talking about all these truths. Now, um, this life application, the Christian can rest certain in the eyewitness accounts of the majesty of Christ. Let's take just a few more minutes and find out what was the second authority. So, so, so Peter said, there's authority, uh, and, and that authority is because you're hearing this from eyewitness accounts. He said, I'm not telling you this because I heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody who read about it. I am telling you this. I was there. I saw Jesus in his glory. I saw that glory with which he is going to return. And the second one is the sure, more sure word of prophecy. Number three, an, uh, an authoritative source that's more that more sure than the testimony. So Peter says, listen, you know what you have? You have a sure testimony from us. We saw it. But look at verse 19. We also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Peter said, you're hearing from a lot of eyewitness test uh, testaments, a, a lot of eyewitness accounts. But let me tell you something that's even more certain. It's a sure word of prophecy. Verse, verse 19, let's finish it there. It says, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is, is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so uh, here, uh, Peter begins to talk about the word of God. Can I share with you this? You know what the Bible claims to be? The Bible claims to be God's word. And here's what, Old Testament, New Testament, here are the claims of scripture. The Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect. It says, thy word is very pure. It says, thy law is truth. It says, all thy commandments are truth. It says, the, the sum, the, 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 um, it says, the sum of thy word is truth. The sum of uh, 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 it says, every one of thy righteous ordinances endures forever. All thy commandments are righteous. The law is holy, just, and good. Scripture uh, can't be uh, broken. Every word of God is pure and flawless. Not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Uh, uh, scripture even calls, uh, it is called the word of truthfulness. Isaiah 65, 16 says uh, that, that, that the Lord calls himself the God of truth. Jeremiah 10, the prophet writes, the Lord is the true God. And the New Testament agrees with the Old Testament, calling God a God of truth. John 3, God is truthful. John 17, the only true God. Uh, 1 John 5, he is the true God. And then there are several passages in the Old and New Testament that tell us that God cannot lie. My friend, what you have in the word of God is what Peter called a more sure word of prophecy. Uh, and it's not carelessly that we get the canonized uh, 66 books of the Bible. And so Peter is talking about this. He's at the end of his life. You know what I'm depending on? I'm depending on the fact that we have eyewitness testimonies, and I'm one of them. You know what I'm depending on? Scripture that's perfect and whole, and a, a God that is truthful. And so Peter tells us that uh, James and, uh, and John, uh, as well as himself, they saw the proof. They saw the majesty of the glory of God, but Peter said, there's a better source than that. It's in Matthew 24, 27 there in your outline. It says, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. <clears throat> for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great 
glory. And he shall <clears throat> send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect and the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. What Peter was written, uh, what was teaching here was the written word of prophecy in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he said, that's more authoritative than my personal experience, although I'm an eyewitness. More authoritative than that is the whole of Scripture, which tells you that Jesus is coming again. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of right, in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so what Peter said about this authoritative source, this sure word of, uh, of, of, of testimony, this word of prophecy, he said it's not of private interpretation there in verse 20. Basically what he was saying is that this did not originate <clears throat> in the mind of man. It did not originate there in the mind of man. This wasn't some uh, meaning that was given by man and he created this scripture. It's not of private interpretation. And then secondly, if it's not from the heart and source of man, then where does it come from? Well, from the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Look at verse 21. He says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This isn't saying that, <clears throat> that um, hey, that, that scripture is not interpreted in different ways because that's where false teaching comes from. It's saying uh, it's not by any personal interpretation. He's saying that this was not sourced in the heart of man. How it came about is that the Holy Spirit of God <clears throat> moved and gave his word miraculously through mankind who wrote God's word and recorded it. It's a miraculous process. Nobody knew that better than Peter because Peter had written scripture and he understood God's giving me this and it's a miraculous process. And he said, you can be sure that this is from the Holy Ghost. And so more significantly here, he points to the, to the truthfulness of scripture and Peter wanted to be, uh, at the end of his day, he wanted to remind us of the second coming of God. And so this life application as we get ready to close is this. The Christian can have confidence that he has God's perfect word. <clears throat> we have God's perfect word. And so Peter said, I'm, I'm getting ready to die, but let me stir up your hearts and tell you things that have already been talked about, but let me remind you and stir you up. And so... In order to understand this truth and not be misled by false doctrine, um, Peter spoke of the truth. Friend, that's why we ought to immerse ourselves in God's word. That's why we talk about daily in the word. Why? Because the word of God is the source of truth. God is truth, and our relationship with him uh, <clears throat> exposes us to the truth. In 2 Peter here, 1, look at verse 3. He tells us how this all starts. He says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be, listen, partakers of the divine nature, he said, by this truth God's given to us, that's how we're partakers of this divine nature, how we become believers, how we're gonna live forever. It's a promise of God. This divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust, this corruption of this world uh, can't touch us eternally if our faith is in Jesus Christ. Some of you have had health challenges recently. Those health challenges that you and I go through, they can't define us. They can't, uh, that, that, that we don't get our identity from them because it might hurt and harm and even destroy this body. But, uh, but, but uh, God has a better plan and God has a more sure plan. Uh, and uh, that is what Paul said, that, that, or Peter said, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And he goes on. 
Where it starts, what the foundation is, is faith. The foundation of truth is faith in the truth of the word of God. That faith. It's that faith that saves us. It's that faith that Paul talked about in Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so you can waste time in this life and become very anxious and worried and try to become righteous because you do good works, but that righteousness will never please God. That righteousness is imperfect. There's only one faith or righteousness that please God, pleases God. It's that, that, that righteousness, Paul said, which comes by faith in God, faith in Christ. And he said it again in Romans 10, 3 and 4. He said, for they, speaking of some, unfortunately, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When you know, understand the gospel and you put your faith in Christ, that's the end of the righteousness of the law because you comprehend and understand you can never be righteous by keeping the law. You understand you can never keep the law. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. And so everything in the Bible when it talks about salvation is that it comes by faith. This truth, this incredible uh, truth, these truths that stirred Peter up at the end of his life, it starts with faith in Christ Jesus. Have you put your faith in him? If you have, understand this. This is an incredible hope. It's an amazing promise. And Peter, at the end of his life, he's, he's watched Christians, Felix, get burned. He has watched Christians be wrapped in skin and put out in front of wild animals. We know what happened in the Colosseum. He's seen all that. Peter, you discouraged? Oh, no. I want, as a matter of fact, I'm so not discouraged, I want to stir you up with the truth that's encouraging my heart. That's the kind of Christianity that God gives and offers. And that's the only one that's genuine and true that would withstand the trials of this life. Father, you're good, you're amazing, and spectacular. Would you help us to understand these truths, to commit them to memory, to have a dedication in our life to, to the word of God? that when false teaching comes, and it's all around us, that when false teaching comes, that we would not be shaken with every wind of doctrine that comes our way, but that we would be firmly anchored in the truth of your word. And Father, I pray that you would, uh, that, that, that that would affect us, those who do not know you, they don't have eternity secure, they would consider you and put their faith in you today. And those that do have their faith in you, that we too would know the strength, the peace, the calmness, the confidence that comes with faith in Christ. Thank you for watching today's message. We at International Baptist Church believe that the Word of God is a vital part in the life of every believer. As we study God's Word on a weekly basis, we'd love to have you join us in person. You can join us either at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings, or come be a part of our Bible study on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. If you have questions about the message that you've watched today, feel free to contact us at info at internationalbaptistny.org or give us a call at 718-436-4971. Again, thank you for joining us for today's message.